Wrong Place, Right Time, written and read by Mike Hayes. New Year's Eve 2018. Janice Thomas, 21 on the morrow, had always been a bit of a moaner about her birthday, always a leftover feel about it, family and friends alike. She was out with her uni friends, all girls, on the three-year course leading to qualification as a physiotherapist. Her performance to date suggested she qualified for his time of asking. Casual boyfriends had come and gone. One actually lasted a whole term. As was their custom, they decided to move on somewhere else, locally, within walking distance, where there might be some blokes. All very normal. Nothing new, their routine. Ladies Lou, freshen up the lipstick, bully their individual hairstyles, gather their thoughts. The five barged elbow their way through the crowd, mainly male, but with enough females to provide scornful and derisory comment from the little gang of leavers. The party of five had only had two rounds of drinks and three of them were leaving half full glasses. Janice was one of them. All five knew exactly where they were heading, so there was no follow me stuff. The first three crossed safely to the far side, but Janice, her eyes on her disappearing friends, just did not see the black car to her right. The driver had seen her and did everything he could to avoid hitting her. The near side wheel arch caught Janice's right leg a glancing blow. The car stopped, both front doors flung open, and two young men rushed to her side. It was impossible to count the number of phones already in hand, most probably dialing 999. But it worked. Within minutes, blue lights and sirens filled the road where Janice lay, surrounded by friends and the two men from the car. Bystanders turned traffic wardens guided the traffic along the other lane. Janice was conscious, crying, my leg, my leg hurts. The car passenger, under the watchful eye of the driver, was doing his best to make her more comfortable, covering her as best he could with his jacket. With the arrival of the ambulance, the police gave way a little, cleared the space and let the ambulance staff do their bit. The two men from the car stepped back and were separated by the police. There was no discussion between the ambulance men, or with the police. Janice Thomas was carefully lifted onto a stretcher and into the back of the ambulance. The driver and his mate got on board and with siren going, all lights flashing, departed for the city's main hospital. The driver of the car and his companion were ushered into separate police cars and immediately breathalyzed. To the consternation of both police officers, the results were negative. The tests were repeated three times, just in case there was a faulty batch or something. Even in the poor light, the officer's disappointment was obvious to all. A second ambulance arrived and was quickly sent on its way by the now superfluous police constable, but he had earned his corn by moving the dwindling numbers of onlookers so that the blue light pickup truck could hoist the car and take it for inspection. The casualty department at County Hospital was already doing a good business with folk of all ages, both genders, who'd come a cropper, so typical of too much alcohol and too many people in the same place at the same time. After all, it was New Year's Eve. But the ambulance blue light and advance warning meant Miss Thomas had a welcome party of her own. Medical Staff spread across a wide range. Physical examination, X-ray, a CT scan revealed a fraction of the tibia. Nothing the orthopedic lot hadn't seen before and didn't have the answer to. The senior man will have to pen it, settle things. He turned to the colleague next to him. See theatre sister, go for 12 o'clock, 2400. Contact the duty anaesthetist, make sure he's free. Ring ward sister for a single room bed with hoist. He turned away from the group to leave, but when he got to the door, he turned, 
By the way, get her alcohol levels checked so the gas man can't back out. Before the door swung shut, the next in line was detailing the other jobs, requirements, blood to hematology, next to kin to be informed, weight and height, and more. Nothing new, done it all before. Everything went well. Half an hour in recovery, back to her room, leg in a sling, wards that fussing all over her as they do. During one of the hourly inspections, the nurse added, Oh, by the way, you had a visitor waiting for you, a cardiologist. You've got heart problems, nothing in your records. A sleepy, dozy Janice just shook her head. Very little was making sense. Then she slept, just like post-op patients do, for two full hours before being woken to answer more questions. You ready to eat anything? Just a little, must try. Do you want a bottle? Haven't been since you come in. Jan answered yes to both questions and was rewarded with a good girl. Things were beginning to make sense. Memory flashbacks were joining up and clearer picture was building in her head. The tray was still on her bed when the nurse came to us. Dr. Stewart from cardiology on his way. Let's tidy you up a bit. Just the mention of the word brought Janice Thomas to a new level of anxiety. Didn't know I had heart problems. Nor us. Nothing in your notes. Just checking, doing his job, was intended to calm the young lady. It didn't. Twenty minutes had elapsed before a youngish, fairly good-looking, white-coated male entered her room, having first whispered to the staff nurse in charge. He seemed oblivious of the sling, the bandages, half-plastered leg, Confidently dudging the sling, he was speaking to the patient before the swing doors had closed. Well, hello there. Stuart Martin, I work here. It was my car that done that. Sorry, I've had a peep at the right up Op went well, no complications. Young thing like you will mend well. Perhaps the plastic boys can do something about the scar if it bothers you. I called last night after the fuzz let me go. Wouldn't believe me. I hadn't been drinking. It was only when they saw the CCT that they accepted my story. Not drunk, not speeding, not distracted. Just didn't have time to turn the car sharply enough to avoid you. So sorry. Spoilt my record. Spoilt your night out. He stopped in mid-sentence. It's your birthday today. Note it in your notes. Happy birthday as much as you can. Janice's mind was trying to process. My birthday, yes, hit by his car, not entirely his fault. Mine for stepping off the pavement. Too close to miss me. He continued. The police will come to see you. You must tell them we've met again. Well, sort of. They know where I am. Be patient. The orthobots here are good. They want you up and about before you want to. Believe me. Must go, got nose to write up. See you tomorrow. Short, sharp, and to the point. Well, Dr. Martin Stewart kept his word quite diligently. Every day for five days he called when convenient, that was to him, to see her, to chat, and to monitor progress. A policeman came on the Friday, explained to her her rights, and said she could see the CT footage if she called at the station. She declined. On day four, she was visited bedside by two physiotherapists who were excited, animated about their new charge and challenge. Good for us, somebody young, one of us, see, know the patient's side. Pride made her do as instructed. It hurt, but she, they, persevered. Stuart came every day. On the day before her discharge, mindful she was not one of his, he said, On the basis you're not one of my patients, I'd like to take you out to dinner sometime somewhere. Got a number I can call? Are you you sure? Not all your fault. May as be, but the invite stands. I can collect you, see you safely home. Want you back to uni, be one of us. Her leg improved. Distance learning meant she kept up her studies from home. On her hospital visits to the physio, she stayed on and learned by helping, observing, listening. She qualified first time of asking and got a junior post at the city's other, much smaller hospital. 
When they shifts allowed, Martin Stewart were inseparable. Cinema, theatre, walks on the beach came and went. Fertile sex progressed to fulsome, meaningful lovemaking. There was mutual anxiety of meeting respective parents. In June, they holiday abroad as a couple. In September, they rented a flat together in joint names, and she moved in. New Year's Eve 2019, they spent in. Food leftovers, unfinished glasses of wine, television on, sound turned down. From the kitchen, I think we should get married. Janice, head in a magazine but not reading. Oh, and why is that? Well, don't you want to? Never been asked properly. Oh, like that, is it? Okay, will you marry me? She almost flung herself into his arms. Big Ben chimed midnight and welcomed the new year. Yes, yes, of course, of course. Thought you'd never ask. From his pocket, he produced a small brown box. A tear rolled down her cheek. 